So it's 11.59. Probably the wisest thing would be if, you, if I ask you to stand up for the final benediction. <laughs> and this way we'll meet the parallel service people, which has never happened in history probably before. But you can imagine it also this way. Imagine it's a final of the World Cup and England is playing Germany. It's the 89th minute and it's 1-1. You know it needs to be decided. You don't want it to go into penalties, do you? <laughs> so you want the referee to add an overtime. Are you going to be happy? Or do you want it to go to the penalties? So imagine this is the overtime you are going to get. I don't know about you, but I sometimes am wrong. Seriously wrong. The realization of this did not come to me easy. You know, I'm a third generation Adventist. I'm a son of a pastor. I was a youth leader in my church by the time I was 17. But once I got married, I realized that <laughs> things are not always the way I perceive them. And it's possible to see things from a different angle. And I have learned that it's important only to be so convinced that you are still convincible. Because if you are so convinced that nothing in the world can convince you anymore, it's going to be difficult, not only for people who live next to you, around you, but for the Lord. You see, the only way to grow and to be changed is to realize that sometimes the way we see things, our perspective, is not the only one. That's not equal to God's perspective. And God wants us to grow. God wants us to be transformed. God's plan for us is to be transformed rather than be comfortable. So, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. And there is this famous story which can be used not only at Christmas, but also in September. And I am going to concentrate only on two words because of the time. In verse 19... It says, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. So he had in mind to divorce her quietly. This word, righteous man, he was a, Joseph was a righteous man. The word righteous is a technical expression. In Hebrew, it was a single word, tzaddik. He was a tzaddik. Now, in that society, to be known as tzaddik, as the righteous person, meant that was a person who was known by his uncompromising obedience to the book, to the book of Torah, the law. So, in other words, whatever the Torah said, this is what Joseph did. So he did not eat any ham sandwiches because it was under the unclean foods. He performed all the ritual cleansings. He did not mix with the wrong kind of people. He did not keep his carpentry shop open late Friday night in order to make a few extra drachmas. He was tzaddik. This is who he was. And everybody in that little village knew Joseph is a tzaddik. Nobody invited him for a dinner with tax collectors, prostitutes, because he was a tzaddik. And in that culture, people aspired to be a tzaddik, to be a righteous person. That's what they wanted. Just in like in our culture, a businessman wants to be a CEO, an athlete wants to win an Olympic gold medal, a footballer wants to play for Watford, and an Adventist young person wants to study at Newbold College. <laughs> to be an Israelite meant to be a tzaddik, because then you would be looked up to, admired, and respected. In that culture, to be tzaddik meant to be somebody. You have arrived, and this is who Joseph was. 
But Joseph has a problem. He's engaged. It's obviously, and we don't have time to go into this, he's a widower, his wife died, he has a few children from the previous marriage, and his parents arranged this marriage to Mary. Mary is about 13 to 15 years old, and Joseph is waiting for her to grow up, to be an adult, so that he can marry her. In that society, engagement was a serious thing. It was not something that happened on a Friday night in the back seat of the car. So the two families came together, signed the contract, it was a big thing, and the only way to cancel that was by divorce. Now, he's engaged, and his fiancée is pregnant, but he's not the father. And you can imagine, in that little village, this is a big problem. This is not acceptable. Now, what is he going to do? Because he was a good man, a righteous man, he wants to do the right thing. How do you know what is the right thing? What is Joseph supposed to do? A famous English writer, Somerset Morgan, said, the strongest desire of humans in civilized society is to get the approval of people around you. You are going to do what brings an approval of people who are important for you. So Joseph could go to his friends and ask them, what ought I to do. What do you think I ought to do? Get over the, on the phone, talk about the problem in his work, talk about it in, uh, over a coffee, tea, talk about it everywhere, everywhere, tell everybody, did you hear about Mary? What do you think I should do? Spread it everywhere. But Joseph is not going to do this. He's not going to expose Mary, he's not going to disgrace her. He's not going to humiliate her. I'm sure if he asked his mates, what am I supposed to do? Somebody would say to him, oh, just do what the Bible says. You can't go wrong if you do what the Bible says. What about that for an answer? I have heard it all my life. Just do what the Bible says. So let me tell you what the Bible says. The Torah has a very clear instructions on what to do in that situation. If a woman was pledged to be married and found to be sexually unfaithful, there is a text in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Torah, that covers this. And so in Deuteronomy 22, 21, it says, She should be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. She has done a disgraceful thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge this evil from among you. Deuteronomy 22, 21. Now, when your whole reputation, when your whole identity revolves around one thing, to do what the Torah says, you are in a serious predicament. The Torah says she's supposed to be stoned, taken out and stoned to death in front of all the people. That's what the Bible says. You know, I get sick and tired of people thumbing the Bible, thinking that if they quote the passage from the Bible, that clears everything. You can quote Quran or Bible to justify just anything under the sun. If you have a good concordance, you can find a text in the Bible can, that can justify just anything. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says if a man finds something displeasing in his wife, he should give her a divorce letter and send her out of the house. That's what the Bible says. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that women should keep their heads covered and their mouths shut. <laughs> and I'm not going to give you the reference. You need to find it yourselves. <laughs> but yes, it's in the Bible. Joseph is a good man, he is a righteous man, his whole identity revolves around doing what the Torah says, 
but he rises to the point that is absolutely remarkable for his day and time. He loves his Bible, he knows his Bible, and that's noble. But when he reads his Bible, he reads it through a certain kind of lens. Lens of the character and nature of God who is loving and kind. And therefore, when he reads the Torah, he comes to the conclusion saying, I am not going to harm her, I am not going to humiliate her, I am not going to expose her, I am not going to shame her, to ridicule her, to demean her value, her dignity, her worth. I am going to be nice to her. Imagine, Joseph says, I am going to protect her. Where did the, you read that in the Bible, Joseph? I will tell you where it says. It says in the very nature and character of God that inspired the Bible. It's so absol absolutely amazing that Joseph, as the first person in what is our New Testament, on the very first page of the New Testament, shows us how to read the Bible, the Old Testament, and everything. He reads the Bible through the spectacles of grace and the goodness and the love of God. And you and I learn from this. If you're reading the Bible, if being religious, you find justification for humiliating, disgracing, harming, or hurting other people, if reading the Bible makes you feel better than others, you are reading it absolutely wrong. The Bible is to be read in the light of the character of God. Remember, his whole identity as a tzaddik, as a righteous person, is at stake. Everybody in the village assumed they knew what he's going to do. His fellow tzaddikim would remind him, just do what the Bible says. And that's where the story carries a strange turn. Literally, the text says in verse 18, being a righteous man, he, vo vo he wanted to avoid a scandal. It's a little bit tricky to translate, but a New Testament scholar by the name Don Hagner says, the best translation of this passage should probably sound something like this. Although he was a righteous man, or in spite of the fact that he was a tzaddik, he did not want a scandal. In spite of the fact that he was a righteous man, he was a sadiq, he did not want to put her to a scandal. See, there is a tension going on in this story. And the religious system in which Joseph grew up, righteousness demanded that Mary was exposed. Sinners needed to be excluded. Standards have to be maintained. No righteous man of his day would hesitate. But strangely, Joseph hesitates. He cannot bring himself to say those words. He cannot bring himself to lead the parade to drag her to her father's house. He cannot bring himself to go public. Do you understand the anguish that's going on in him day after day when he struggles with what is he supposed to do? By the time the angel comes to him, Joseph has struggled with this for some time. He don't know how long, but he already knows that Mary is pregnant. Who do you think was the most likely person to tell Joseph? There are always some sisters in the church that have the spiritual gift of telling <laughs> who is pregnant, who is not. But let's assume that it was Mary herself who told him. Now imagine the conversation. Now, for you to imagine it well, uh, can you tell me how old is Mary? She's about 13 to 15 years old. So imagine the conversation, picture that, put yourself in Joseph's place. Here is a widower engaged to be married, and your fiancé is 13 to 15 year old girl. 
And she comes to him and says sweetly, Hey Joseph, I have something to tell you. I have some bad news and some good news. Which one do you want to hear first? <laughs> the bad news is that I am pregnant, even though I have not been unfaithful to you. The bad news is I am pregnant. The good news is I have not been unfaithful to you. I haven't been with anybody. An angel came to me. Now remember, this is a 13 to 15 year old girl. An angel came to me and he said, Hail Mary, full of grace. You have found special favor with God and that's why you are going to have a miracle baby conceived by the Holy Spirit and all generations are going to call you blessed. Except for Protestants, of course. Imagine how she must have protested her innocence to Joseph. And imagine how Joseph is struggling now. Yeah, yeah. Who of my buddies is going to believe this? When I tell my friends, who of them is going to say, yeah, sure. Now she's so sweet. She seems to believe this. But what? An angel to a 13 to 15 year old girl in some unimportant obscure village in the middle of nowhere, far away from Jerusalem, million miles away from Rome? Angel? No way. And so when he thinks about this, he decides he's going to divorce her. He's going to re return the dowry to her, which he didn't have to. Give her the certificate and do it quietly, and that will solve the problem. That way, maybe he could minimize her suffering, still maintain his status as a tzaddik in his society. Do you feel the tension, the battle that's going on? And then comes the second thing that I want you to notice. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, verse 20, in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Where does the fear enter the picture? Why does the angel say, do not be afraid? How did we get to the fear? What is he afraid of? Is he afraid of that if he doesn't do what the Torah says, that he's incurring the displeasure of God? And God says, an angel to him and say, well done, man, I am proud of you. You are reading the Torah right. But there is more to it. Don't be afraid is that Joseph is afraid of losing his reputation. Joseph is afraid, what is everybody going to think of him? Joseph is afraid that the status that he has been, that has taken him the lifetime to build up is going to be destroyed. He must have had his own doubts whenever Mary came to him and told him about the angel. And that's why he decided to divorce her quietly. There's no way people in the village are going to believe that an angel came to a poor couple in an obscure village and impregnated a virgin teenage girl. Joseph is afraid that if he marries this girl, his friends would never accept his account of the story, his version of what had happened. He would never again be invited into the homes of other tzaddik, other righteous people. He would not be given their business anymore. He would suffer financially. He would be shunned socially. Staying with her meant committing a social and religious suicide. Never again he's going to be admired and respected as a lover and doer of Torah. If he committed himself to this baby Jesus and to his mom, that would be an enormous sacrifice for him. His whole reputation, the work of a lifetime, would be crashed. And that's why the, angels come, the angel comes and says, don't be afraid. Now imagine, he built up this reputation all his life and suddenly he's blocked into achieving it. He must have felt angry. 
Suddenly this status is taken away from him. He must have felt sad. And of course, he has no clue what the future holds. So he is afraid. Now let me tell you, when people face anger, sadness, fear, at the same time, usually they don't make the best decisions. And you know what's remarkable? The remarkable thing is, he looks at this mess and says, which is not of his making, he did nothing to contribute to it, and says, I am going to be nice. I am going to be kind. And you know what was the result? Turn quickly to Mark 6, 3. Mark 6, 3, this is 30 plus years later. Here you can see the price that Joseph paid for his decision. It's a scene set back in Jesus' hometown, in Nazareth. And Jesus comes during his public ministry, so he's 30 plus years old. And during his ministry, he comes back to Nazareth. And the people of his village are expressing their skepticism about him. They don't think much about Jesus, his claims, his miracles. And this is what they say in verse 3, Mark 6, verse 3. And they asked, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom that he has been given him, that he can even do miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the Mary's son? Now let me tell you, in that culture, you cannot refer to a person as Mary's son. You can always, you always refer to people as son of his father. Even though Joseph is dead by now, his reputation still is tarnished. Because people say, instead of, oh, this is Jesus, the son of Joseph. Instead of saying, this is Yeshua bar Joseph. They say, isn't this Jesus, the son of Mary? Now, for you to understand what it means to say Jesus, the son of Mary, is like in English language when you refer to someone in really harsh expression, saying, you know, that someone is the son of a, and you use the name for a female dog. It's so crude, it's so insulting, and it's so painful, even though Joseph has been dead for some time, his reputation has never recovered. Mark 6.3 shows that three decades later, in that little village, Joseph's reputation still has not recovered from his marriage to Mary. And Mary and Jesus are the only people who knew why Joseph did that. What a radical love. I was thinking this week that maybe God decided that Jesus, who would be later called a friend of sinners, would be raised in a family that knew firsthand what it felt like to be regarded as a spiritually second-class citizen, second-class category. This is how Jesus was feeling when he was growing up. There were whispers about him and his mom in their village. Maybe the reason why Jesus had such a heart for unrespectable people was that he was raised in a family that lost respectability because of the circumstances of his birth. Maybe why Jesus had such a compassion for women who were walking scandals was that he knew what it meant for his mom, that his father decided to, stuck, to stick by her when she was a single and pregnant, and all the righteous folks, all the tzaddikim, would have picked up the stone. So, fast forward 30 plus years. Open your Bible to John Chapter 8, John 8, verses 1 to 11. 
there is a story about a woman that was caught in adultery. And that Sadikim and the righteous people who are there to enforce the Torah bring her to the presence of Jesus real fast. They dragged her into Jesus' presence and they said to him, verse 4, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. And then they say, as a good tzaddik, as good tzaddikim, as good righteous people, in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, women, now what do you say? You are supposed to be a tzaddik. What do you say? How do you see it? And the text says that Jesus bent down and writes on the ground. For 2,000 years, people have been trying to figure out what he was writing. There have been a lot of guesses. Some people think that he, maybe he was writing the Ten Commandments. There is one text in the Old Testament that says that God was writing with his finger. What was it? Ten Commandments. Here the text says Jesus is writing with his finger. There are others who say that maybe he was writing the sins of people in the circle because the story later continues that people started to disappear starting with the oldest whose sins were more numerous and ending with the youngest whose sins were more recent. But maybe in that moment Jesus thought, what am I going to do now? If I say, go ahead and stone her, Jesus is in trouble with Romans for taking capital punishment into his own hands. If he says, just be nice, don't worry about Moses, he's in trouble with the Jews for not taking the Torah seriously. Torah that was given by God. Just maybe. Jesus remembered a scared 13-year-old pregnant girl in a small village 30 years ago, consumed by a scandal and how this young, strong tzaddik named Joseph gave up everything to stand by her side and be nice to her. And so he decided, I am going to do what my father did. All right, Sadikim, verse 7. He said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And one by one, they melted away. Jesus is left alone with her woman because he loved and protected her when all the righteous people were ready to stone her. And we say, like the father, like the son. Like the father, like the son. So, here's the conclusion. Imagine if Garston, Watford, Abbots Langley and Kings Langley knew if you go to this place, if you go to Stamborough Park, this is the place where people are going to show you radical love. What would happen if it did not matter whether someone is homeless or CEO, what color, what nationality they are, how they are dressed. What would happen if the word would be spread around London among atheists and addicts and workaholics and divorced people and confused people? There is a place in Garston where you just get loved. Because when we ask what kind of community, what kind of people do we want to be the next two years? Maybe God is calling us to the radical love. Not just people who are easy to love, people who will love you back, who are like you. In Matthew 5, 46, Jesus said, And if you love those who will love you, what great thing are you doing? Babies do that. Mafia does that. If you want to grow spiritually, God is going to send you a difficult person into your life to stretch you emotionally, spiritually. How many of you have a difficult person in your life? Can you raise your hand? 
I mean, I didn't ask you to point out that person, I just asked you to raise the hand. If you don't, just tell the pastor, the pastors keep a list, they will assign you one. <laughs> because in the coming days and weeks, you are going to, to bump into somebody, maybe in your office, maybe in your family, maybe among your relatives, who is going to be a difficult person. And it's your choice what you are going to do. You can cross your arms, you can pick up a stone. Sadly, a lot of people do that, a lot of churches do that. You can pass the judgment if you want to. You can say this person doesn't, doesn't measure up to my standards. He is too odd, too bad, too wrong, too loud, too conservative, too liberal, too something else. You can do that if you want to. Or you can hear God's invitation to radical love. And just remember, God accepted you the way you are. Just the way you are. Here's the quote from American writer Anne Lamott. You can safely assume that you have made God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. If your God hates the same people that you do, you can be sure you have created God in your own image. Because God is about radical love. Jesus showed that. Showed the love that nobody else would. No tzaddik would do that. One day they came to him and said, Who do you think you are? Do you think you are a righteous man? You call yourself a tzaddik? We will tell you who you are. You are a friend of sinners. You embrace people that a tzaddik would never do. And Jesus said, yes, that's right. In Matthew 5, 20, he said, and I tell you the truth, unless your righteousness, unless your tzaddikness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of God. Unless, your tzaddikness is different than the tzaddikness of people around you, you are not part of what I am doing. And people wondered, what kind of righteousness is he talking about? But Jesus knew his father was such a man. His father was such a God. And if anybody wants to be part of what he's doing, and the part of community that he started, this new community, you better believe in radical love and practice it. Not in order to impress people how good and spiritual you are, but because God loved each one of us. When we have been wrong, sinful, with such a radical love. Amen.